אנגלי ועברי, תודה שבאתם, עזרנו את האירוע הזה די מהר, להכיר לו את התעשייה פה בארץ, אז שמי אהרון אורנשטיין, קודם כל יצאנו, למי שלא מכיר, כמו כן אני הבעלים והמארגן של הכנס פיק טיים. בפיק טיים שיש לי גם איזושהי קבוצה קטנה וחמודה בפייסבוק של קצת מקסטק, ששם אנחנו מעלים ומגייסים לקדם את החברות של תחום טכנולוגיה נקרא לזה הפיצ'ריסטיק בישראל. אני מזמין את כולכם להצטרף ולעזור לתעשייה, לעזור לחברים שלנו פה. אני רוצה להודות קודם כל לבלונד 2.0.PR שעזרו לנו להרים את כל האירוע הזה למעשה קובל הוא אורח שלהם שהגיע לארץ לפגש עם כל החברות שלהם אז אני רוצה מאוד להודות להם כמו כן הפיצות שאכלתם פה הגיעו אלינו מטנביס יש לנו פה שני נציגים של טנביס רוני ואסף איפה אתם? הנה הם שם, תודה רבה לרוני, אסף טנדיס על הפיצות, טנדיס עכשיו השיקה מחדש את האפליקציה שלהם של המצפים, האפליקציה הגדולה בישראל, ואני מזמין באמת את כולכם, זה שעוד אין לו את חשבון בטנדיס לעובדים שלו, לפנות אליהם, לדעות שלהם עכשיו יסגרו את הפיצ'אק. יש לנו כמובן את המארחים שלנו פה, רייז, רייז אקסלרטור של ברקליס, פחות קשור לתחום שלנו פה, אבל אם אתם מכירים חברות מעולם פינטק, זה המקום שהם מחפשים קשר לעבוד ישירות עם בנק הארטריס ופיקי, זה המקום בשבילהם. אז זהו, אני רוצה להודות שוב לכולכם. אנחנו נתחיל מהאורח הראשי שלנו, רוברט, לאחר מכן אנחנו נקפוץ לסקירה של השוק הישראלי, ולאחר מכן יהיו לנו שני פאנלים, אחד גם פוקוס הסופטר ואחד על הארדוור. אני אעדכן תוך כדי כל פעם מה קורה שיש לי פנים. האירוע הוא בלייב סטרימינג עכשיו בפייסבוק, מי שרוצה, להעביר הלאה לחברים. הוא נמצא תחת הקבוצה, נקסטק. וזהו, אובר, פליז. Cool. Uh, what a week. Um, I've seen everything from a porn company this week to a drone, an autonomous drone company, to uh, all sorts of machine learning from medical and other places. Um, I, for people who don't know who I am, I go around the world and meet with tech executives and uh, innovators and people who are building new things. And I put the learning up on Facebook generally or other places. And um, this is sort of what I'm seeing. Um, and I'm going to add in some of the stuff I've seen over the last week. Because my thinking is starting to change a little bit about how aggressive this industry is going to be. Um, I work at Upload VR uh, in San Francisco, which is a new media company that covers the virtual reality and, and mixed reality spaces. So when you go to places like Meta, you're starting to see all sorts of new devices that are coming along for the face. Today I visited Infinity uh, AR, and they're building a similar pair of glasses. And we're building a new kind of operating system, and I think, um, or a new kind of user experience, new kind of user interface. And I think it's really important to denote that this is uh, the portal major visible user interface, right? The first one was DOS, the second one was GUIs, or the first one was character mode, second one was GUIs like the Macintosh and Windows, the third one was uh, Touch, and the fourth one I call Spatial, where it's mapping the world and making a new user interface possible on top of the world. It's really important, I think, uh, when there's changes in user interface because it causes major uh, changes in companies. 
Uh, companies either disappear if they don't bet on it early enough on the new user interface. When we went to Windows, Borland and WordPerfect went away. They were major companies back then. And when we went to Touch, uh, BlackBerry and Nokia went away, and they were major companies. And I remember getting Nokia executives hacked for three years after the iPhone came out, and they said, oh, we have market share. And they're gone today, not really. I mean, they're still around, but they're minor little things. And so in the next five years, it's very clear to me that this new user interface is going to show up. Uh, here is a video from Google Tango. Google's bringing out uh, the uh, Tango phone with um, Lenovo in a few days. And we're building a, a new user interface. And I wanted to give you a, a sampling of some of the primitives that I'm seeing in R&D labs and with computer scientists. This video is from the Tango team. And it's already a year old, so it's uh, pretty crude compared to some of the things I'm seeing this week. But soon you're going to have sensors on your phone, on your drone, on your glasses, on your self-driving car that are going to work in space and, and, and build things on top of the world around us. They're going to sense how, how fast we're going, where we're going, what floor we're on, where we're in a store, uh, and they're going to start categorizing the world as we look around, and they're going to start mapping the world out as we look around. Um, this is coming in a few weeks with the Lenovo phone, which has several sensors on it, and you aim the phone around, and it maps the world in three dimensions. And many of the people in this room are building these systems uh, and uh, thinking about this new world. When you map the world out and you categorize it in real time, you can start laying things on top of the world. You can start replacing things in the world with virtual items. We call this mixed reality, right? And we're starting to see it. If you play with the Infinity AR glasses or the Microsoft HoloLens, you're seeing things laid on top of the world in a virtual way. It's just the viewing angle today is small. The glasses are expensive, they're slow, they get hot, there's lots of uh, things wrong with them. But we know in this industry that things get better and get better fast. Most of the people I met with this week said they need two flips of Moore's Law to make this world happen and happen in a consumer-friendly way. So that's about four years, right? Maybe less, maybe more, but not much more and not much less. I wanted you to see the primitives because um, if I was giving a talk on Microsoft Windows back in 1994, I would have to explain how the system works underneath. The mouse move messages that happen and the API that an application developer would be able to build an application on top of the primitives. And here we're building systems that are going to know it's a floor and going to know where to put lines and videos, graphics on top of the world. And it's a new skill set, right? Uh, if, you, if you know how to build Windows apps, you're going to need to learn some new skills. For this world, you're going to need to learn how to think in three dimensions and how to talk to the system and how to get um, surfaces that you can put things on top of. It's a world that if you're at work right now, you're starting to use it. At Caterpillar, you're already wearing glasses from ODG and others that overlay data on top of the tractor and teach you how to fix the tractor and to then show you what to do. At Rolls-Royce, if you work on the jet engines, they are using the same thing. They are uh, using glasses that augment the reality, that put uh, data on top of the uh, real world and help you do your work. It's happening in the enterprise first because at work you don't care about having a pair of ugly glasses on and your the work can see that there's value in spending the $3,000 on the glasses and then the million dollars on the software. 
and the software is a limited uh, set of things that it's going to recognize. Seeing a jet engine and overlaying the CAD drawings on top of it is fairly simple compared to the unstructured world that we're going to uh, be laying things on top of in the next 10 years. So if you play with something like Magic Leap, here you're looking through a Magic Leap glass, and Magic Leap is a company in Florida that got $1.3 billion without having a customer and without having a product, which uh, proves that you don't need adoption to get venture capital. <laughs> but they have an amazing demo, and they have an entrepreneur who made a million dollars on his previous company, and that's one reason he, he got taken seriously. But it overlays data on top of the real world. And you notice it's locked to the real world. So the virtual items here are properly locked to the table. And the glasses have to recognize what is on the desk. And notice it put the items where there was a workable surface. It didn't try to put it on top of the glasses or anything. It's Pretty fantastic world coming. Uh, I've gotten a demo of HoloLens and, and Meta, and I haven't gotten a demo of this, but a lot of my friends have. Meta is uh, makes you think that you're in Tony Stark's lab, and it's very emotional watching it. When, when I came home, you saw my video. Uh, Stephen Wolfram uh, cried in it, from what I understand, and people who get the demo. I mean, even with Meta, which isn't as good as Magic Leap, are, are very emotional about it because it's a new computing that's magical, right? You can grab things out of the air, you can spin them around, you can poke at them with your fingers, and um, more. To control this new world, we're not going to use a, a mouse anymore, right? With Windows, you use a mouse and it had a tracking ball in it. Here we're going to use our eyes, and we're going to use our hands. So Meta and Magic Leap, are, you have a sensor array that see our fingers, and we can gesture to it with HoloLens. You can uh, click on things in the air just by using your fingers. But uh, this guy, uh, Jim Margraf, runs a company called iFluence. And let's just uh, listen to him and watch the screen. He's using his eyes to control what's on the screen. If I want to, I can change pages. Here's another uh, um, a close-up of uh, uh, some electronics in our office, and I can go home when I want to. Over here is a medical application, and um, all with your eyes. All with my eyes. So I'm doing this solely with my eyes, as fast as I can look. I'm not waiting. I'm not winking. I'm just looking. And here I've got uh, um, the patient. And I've got some allergy record, protocols, insurance, confidential information, current conditions. Why is he here? Well, he tells me he's got a pain in his foot. Notice I'm looking at this, but there's nothing happening on the screen. But when I decide, for instance, that I want to check out his x-ray, there it is. And now I want to go back because a couple screens ago there's some confidential information, which is here. And um, now it's going to take a picture of my eye. It grabs it, says, oh, who is that? Confirms that it's me. And in a moment you'll see that it'll give me access. I'm Jim, head of, so I'm CEO and founder of uh, iFluence. And there it is. I've got confidential information. When I want to, I can return home as fast as that. That's amazing. All of my eyes. That's amazing. So um, these are the sensors that he's built. Uh, he only let me film one tenth of the demo. The other pieces of it, where he had me put it on, and then he said, "Look at a Coke can, or look at a phone." I took a picture with my eyes, went to Google, figured out what the product was, went to Amazon and then presented a visual menu and said, would you like to buy this thing and cost whatever? All with my eyes. So think about walking around the world and interacting with things, looking at people, looking at things, and being able to, to do a new kind of computing. Yeah. And so uh, this is a demo of the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, same kind of thing. It has four cameras on it. It maps out the world and tracks the world as you look around so that you can have virtual items standing on stage with me and I could walk around the item, I could grab the item, twist it, uh, interact with it.
gesture toward it, talk to it maybe, and do a variety of things. Now, these demos make it look a lot more sexy than it actually is in the glasses, because the glasses have a 40 degree viewing angle right now, and so you see just a little tiny window into this virtual thing that would be standing on the stage. But those problems go away with time. And uh, right now they're ugly and big, and they cost $3,000. And those problems also go away with time, right? I mean, uh, I studied with uh, Steve Wisnack in 1989 at the community college at co-founder of Apple, and he um, uh, invited me over to his house and showed me his dye sublimation color printer. It was the first color printer in Silicon Valley, and it cost $45,000. And today, a $70 printer does a better job, right? So, if we can't afford the right thing, just stay alive. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and you know, the demos that they give you are new kinds of education where you can interact with virtual things. Uh, at TED, they showed off that they were talking to, to a real guy uh, who was virtu there virtually on top of the surface of Mars doing a new kind of interaction and new kind of uh, education. It's quite exciting, and uh, the future is really interesting here. So, um, yeah, let's kind of, so that's about, I'm saying now five years away, maybe even longer for it for the consumer success. I mean, the Newton came out, and then 10 years later, the iPhone came out. The Newton definitely showed us what the phone, or what something in our hand would look like, but very few of us bought it or adopted it. It took you know another 10 years for that to happen, and that might happen here as well. That it, you know, the nerds in this room will all have it within three years, and then it'll be another seven years before uh, you know, Elon Musk comes out with a Tesla one that's really nice, you know. Um, so let's uh, come back toward today um, and talk about virtual reality. Um, I have several 360 degree cameras, and I've seen a few uh, new sensors that are coming this week. This is, um, here you're in uh, HTC's Vive. How many people have an HTC Vive here? Yeah, a few. <laughs> A few. That tells me it's a nerdy audience, right? Because this costs eight hundred dollars. You get controllers in your hand, and you get a headset. And there's two sensors that you have to put up on the wall, which need a little bit of setup, right? How long did it take you guys to set it up? An hour. An hour. Yeah. It's not. It's not a pull it out of the box and use it kind of experience, right? And then you have to find the. You have to load up a PC. You have to have a PC with a big NVIDIA card. So you have to spend $2,000 on this. And you have to have a space, right? Um, at least something around this size, optimally 15 by 15, because it'll build a virtual box. And then you can walk around inside the box. And this is uh, Google's Tilt Brush app. So once you, build, once you get it all set up, you can walk around and shoot things and slice watermelons and explore a new world, right? It's very compelling to be in these virtual environments. Um, people who have it, tell me what you're doing with it. What, what's fun so far? Steel brush is really good. Yeah? And, yeah, games, mostly games. Yeah. I'm still recreating content. Yeah. There's a, a new company here creating content. The director of Homeland is here in Tel Aviv and started a new company called Inception that you'll hear about in uh, July. And they're creating very interesting content here in Tel Aviv. So there's a community here of people who care about VR. Anybody else? Uh, Arizona Sunshine's uh, zombie shooter. Zombie shooter. One of the best games ever. You like shooting zombies? No, but that was a cool experience. That is, it made it one of the you best do, experiences. You do like <laughs> Yeah, yeah like actually, now I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So um, when I visited Facebook, they took me in a room and put the headset on, and they sh uh, gave me the new controllers that aren't, aren't even out yet. And they took me into a thing called Toy Box, and that's what you're seeing here. <laughs> and in Toy Box, you can play with somebody else over the internet. Uh, 
And then go up like this. And then light the Roman candle. You can play ping pong over the internet. You can shoot. You can throw things. You can play trains. Uh, you can light things on fire, uh, all with another person over the internet. So the other person somewhere else, as long as they have a, a nice populous setup like this, and they have a high-speed internet connection to you, um, it's quite compelling. This is a new field called social VR. Uh, you're seeing Philip Rosedale, who started Second Life, just started a new company called High Fidelity. He's building a world where you can play with other people and interact with other people. Um, Second Life is also building a world. All Space VR is building a world. And there's others that are coming that are going to let you interact with people in a virtual world. Which is sort of funny, because a lot of people see VR as very antisocial, because when you put on the headset, you're uh, a part from here. Let me borrow your headset. Yeah. Right. When you are wearing the headset, you know I can't see you, right? And I'm uh, antisocial. But when you're inside the headset, you can be very social with somebody else. It's like this guy's building sensors for guns and swords and stuff, right? That's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and so that also shows some of the innovation. So. Um, in the VR world, there's the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift and the Sony PlayStation VR at the high end. These are systems that cut it, mostly cost around $2,000 for the whole setup, but Sony's a little cheaper. <laughs> then there's systems like this, like the Gear VR, which uh, you need a mobile phone for. You already have the mobile phone, so the headset is only $99, but you don't have the ability to walk around and you don't have the controllers. Uh, people like him are building the controllers. So over the next 18 months, you're going to see a variety of mobile-focused controllers come out. And there's you, you're building uh, cameras too, right? To try to, to do mobile positioning too. Mobile positioning, like the Vive. So yeah, for mobile. you're going to put a little camera over here, and then you can. Exactly. We have something through. like that working if you could come to Nikla. There we go. <laughs> That's why I come here. <laughs> see what's coming in the next 18 months. So the, the mobile has the advantage of sales. Uh, the, so, the Samsung already sold a million headsets. The HTC has sold around 60,000 headsets, maybe a little bit more, but not much more. And the Oculus, I assume, is around 100 to 200,000 headsets. Uh, because they're expensive, you, and they're tethered. Uh, you need to be tethered to the big NVIDIA card that's in the PC. Now, the big NVIDIA card uh, has the advantage that it throws a lot more polygons at your eyes, so it can be much more immersive. As you move your head around, it's much uh, lower latency. Um, and there's other advantages as well. But you're tethered, and uh, that's going to be a, and it's expensive. So, and then at the bottom end, there's the Google Cardboards, which are uh, really free. At, at South by Southwest, I got three of them for free. If you buy them, they're, they're like $20. Uh, from five twenty. Three sixty eight. Three sixty eight, yeah. In quantities. <laughs> Absolute vodka give away five thousand of them. In the Indian newspaper, they give away three and a half million. And uh, they were a sheet and then you had to build it. Right? So them away. What's that? One plus two gives them away. Yeah, the New York Times give them away, one plus two. So basically the cardboards are gonna be free. Cardboard you're going to uh, wear it, use for maybe 20 minutes, and then you're going to get tired of it. The Gear VR you can use for 45 minutes before it gets too hot. That's an appetizer. It's an appetizer, right? Yeah. And the, the Vive, I've worn for three hours wow. before I get cut, right? You can get lost. I get for these 25 hours. Though. Yeah, somebody yeah, actually yeah, went. Broke a record. But, you know, that's an yeah. outlier, yeah. right? Throw off. I don't, you know, if you, if you play content that was carefully designed, I don't get sick in the vibe, but I get tired because, you know, how many watermelons can you slice before you're just tired? <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, shoot zombies. How many shoot zombies can you really shoot in uh, four hours, you know? Um, 
there's also industrial uses of VR. This is a guy uh, who, who built a, a motion capture studio in Seattle, and he's selling um, condos in a new way. Um, motion capture rooms like this are used at Ford to design cars. Uh, Disney's new theme park in China was designed in virtual reality, and the guy who uh, runs the uh, did the ride design at Disney told me they saved millions of dollars because they didn't need to build models anymore the way they did when they designed the original Disneyland, and they could visualize much in much more depth what what does the hamburger stand from the top of the ride look like? What and and really uh, think through the park. So, here, just watch what this guy does just, just by walking around a condo. By the way, the, the picture outside the window was done with a drone, so he can actually show you what your view will actually look like in the condo. Do you need to explain anything? No, just, just change the floor. <laughs> right, change the floor. And this is an example of why VR and later AR is going to be so amazing because you're going to be able to walk around the world with AR glasses eventually and change your entire world. You might think you're walking on a gray floor, but no, no you're actually walking on a yeah. beautiful uh, <laughs> uh, hotel floor and looking out at the city in a boring place, right? And the mind uh, can come up with infinite things for us to do in boring places. Really cool. So that's an expensive room with a lot of motion capture devices. This guy's going to make it $25 on a little camera, right? <laughs> and so you're getting a sense of where the industry is going and what's coming. You're seeing all sorts of businesses pop up. This one's in France, uh, where he's taking a 360-degree cam camera into real estate and letting you experience different uh, houses or different apartments in the VR headsets. And he's selling real estate in new ways. I just uh, was at the um, Eiffel Tower in Paris, and there's a new VR business there where you take a VR tour. And it doesn't sound intuitive, but you go up into the Eiffel Tower, you see the city in reality with your eyes, and then you put on the headset and you visit all the places that you're looking at, right? So you get to see what it actually looks like inside the Louvre or inside the uh, Notre Dame church or whatever. And so you can uh, actually do uh, tourism in a new way using these things, right? There's a lot of medical stuff coming with VR. A lot of people say, oh, VR is only for games. And it's absolutely wrong. Um, Stanford's doing it. There's a bunch of uh, colleges doing research on depression because they find that playing VR uh, helps with depression. It helps with pain management in hospitals. And this lady. Uh, showed me, uh, she works with professional athletes, and she um, uh, is a former athlete herself, figured out how to hack her perception system to make her eyes and her perception system much better. And she works with uh, athletes. She took the number one mo um, rugby player in the world who uh, dropped the ball, kept dropping balls at a certain angle that came down at him because he had a weakness in his perception system. He was the worst in the league at that specific task, even though he was the best in the world. He now is best in the world at that specific task using her system. The owner of the South African cycling team said that in six months, she took his worst rider in terms of balls per race, and now he's the best on the team in terms of balls per race. And she's building a VR game that's going to exercise your perception system with uh, things flying around that you have to look at to make your eyes better, your perception system better. Actually, it, it, it's evolution, you know, evolution, real evolution. It, it increases evolution, right? We're, there's a lot of things happening, not just AR and VR. There's a lot of things happening in medical and, and understanding the human brain, understanding how we work, right? There's wearables coming along. It's quite exciting. And we know that we're going to do this because the kids love it. <laughs> and the alcohol mark marketers tell us that we love it too. Absolute Vodka said that they give away 5,000 headsets in a contest, and the average time spent was 19 minutes, and they said they've never had a campaign of any kind where the customer had 19 minutes of interaction with their brand, right? So you're going to get more. 
This guy created a company called Epiphany Eyewear. Uh, he sold to Snapchat. And uh, Snapchat's uh, head of strategy said that probably in the next few months, they're going to announce a connected camera. Now, the camera that he built, and I, these are the prototypes. These are two-year-old pictures. It was a popsicle stick two years ago. So how big is it today? I'm thinking a toothpick, <laughs> right? I'm thinking a very small little camera, costs 100 bucks, does 1080p video right to your iPhone. And Snapchat just bought another augmented reality company to do things on your face and in the world. So they're very, Snapchat is teaching the kids about augmented reality, about changing how we look in real time to make us more interesting. And uh, we're going to see these things. This is the uh, board inside a sunglass frame. Um, a, a lot of companies here in Israel and elsewhere are building uh, wearable monitors. This is uh, Recon Instruments, which came out of um, Israel, I believe, and got bought by Intel. These are Copen screens. They're uh, higher resolution, but smaller. So you can see the trend line. Smaller, better battery life, higher resolution, more uh, capability. And then you add the augmented reality up with Internet of Things. And I visited a company called Cantaloupe Systems in San Francisco. And uh, the guy's dad started a uh, vending machine company because he arrived in, uh, in California from Mexico. He was an immigrant, had $100 in his pocket, couldn't get a job. So he uh, started maintaining vending machines and then uh, got good enough to build a pretty nice business, sent his kids uh, to Stanford and elsewhere. And the kids said, Dad, you're stupid. The way you do this machine is stupid. You have to go up to the machine, open it up, count how many Diet Cokes, how many uh, uh, Snickers bars are sold, and then go down to the track, pick them up, and put them in. And you have to make the, do two trips. And also, if, the, if it was a hot week, like it was this weekend in Selby, the machine sold out, and it's empty and you're uh, wasting inventory, losing money. So they put a Jasper Internet Things card in the machine that, that uh, keeps track of all this and uh, completely changes the supply chain. But now think about uh, augmented reality glasses. We're going to not even need to touch the machine to get a Coke. And in fact, in uh, San Francisco, Uber Eats delivers my lunch in less than five minutes. I'm not using anything else to get stuff in I'm in my office. It comes so fast. And the efficiencies of these the delivery systems are so good now. Now they're only in certain neighborhoods. But again, time solves that problem too. So we're going to be using glasses and talking, I say talking to God. God, I'd like another water. And our water will be delivered. Yeah. Um, these same techniques, these spatial techniques, are going to be used in are used in self-driving cars. This is the Mercedes E-Class uh, car. And uh, they gave me a ride uh, around the desert for an hour and a half, and it drove me around without touching the steering wheel or the gas pedal. So I know it works, in, at least in a simple driving situation. But with, what's really going on is these LIDARs and these sensors are mapping the world in three dimensions. And then our building systems to understand how to navigate through that world. And it's also, thank you, Steve. It's all, Steve, the god, the god lender. <laughs> well, let's get his face <laughs> um, And then they're watching us as well. They're categorizing us in real time. Um, and I, I can't say too much because I've seen some companies here in Israel that are stealth. But the categorization happens in real time on video now. And it looks at you and says, that's a chair, that's a wall, that's a floor, that's a pillar, that's a human, and that's a human X, Y, Z, and that's a human X, Y, Z, D, you know? And uh, it's pretty interesting how advanced this stuff is getting. And persuasion for robots, you know? It's, it's exactly what it is. This is a robot, right? Next, yeah, next time, the robots will move. Yes. And they will understand everything, like everything is showing all the movies. 
And we're going to teach it with our classes. Yeah. Because we're going to walk around with these two sensors, and we're going to teach it. Oh, and that's the control box. I don't know. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> this is leading to a new kind of company that just wasn't possible even just two or three years ago. I, I, I visited uh, Agribol in Illinois, and the company grows virtual socks. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> that's exactly right. It's what? <laughs> Tell that to your mom. Hey, mom, I work at a company, and all we do is grow virtual props. <laughs> yeah, she would say, what kind of real oh, prop are yeah. you smoking? <laughs> but the guy who started explaining that to me, they have 90 employees, by the way. This one company, two years old, has 90, company, 90 employees growing virtual props. They take the data from the drone, from the satellite, from the IoT in the farm, from the farm price data system, um, from your tractor that has sensors on it, whatever data it can get, it ingests it, and it analyzes that data, and then it grows virtual crops using that data, and then it sells the data back to the farmer and says, next Monday, you better not plant because you won't make any money. Or your uh, farm, uh, your field 5B needs more fertilizer than your the field, you know, because it sees all sorts of data, and it tells the farmer what to do. And they have many employees. So, and I'm hearing about a lot of companies like this here and in Silicon Valley and in Illinois and elsewhere, because the data flows that we're able to get now are going up exponentially. And uh, I just saw uh, a medical uh, company here in Israel. Zebra? Zebra, yeah. And they are, they now have millions of pictures of x-rays and MRIs and they've trained the system, machine learning, on those pictures to find certain things. And they're training it for more every day. And so you're going to upload your MRI to their system, and it's going to tell you, oh, you have cancer. Or, oh, no. This is, it's better to know it accurately, because your doctor might miss it, right? Today, your doctor misses some of the, out of a 1,000 cases. They, they miss cases, right? The computer won't miss cases. It'll be much more accurate, and it'll be real time. Because when I got an MRI, I had an MRI one time, and I had to wait 24 hours to get to the doctor to see the results. I'm going to see the results in real time, right? Because it's going to recognize, oh, you have cancer, but <laughs> thank you. That's <laughs> true. God, God's going to save your life, right? Um, Think about walking around a stadium soon with these glasses on. This stadium uh, is, is in Santa Clara, California. This is where um, the Super Bowl was, was in February. This stadium has uh, 1,200 Wi-Fi hotspots, has 2,000 beacons around the stadium, has um, sensors everywhere like this um, that, uh, that give you access off your phone. Because I don't know if you knew, a phone has a beacon in it. And a beacon is a little radio that spits three numbers into the air, right? And if, it, if that beacon was on and I had a sensor, I could tell how close I am to that beacon, right? So as you walk by that Internet of Things device, the phone can authenticate thanks to the beacon with this device. And the device will turn green because you're allowed into the VIP area, right? So think about the stadium. It knows where you bought your ticket. Because you bought it on a mobile phone with a GPS on it and using the app. It knows when you got to the parking lot. In fact, it knows when you're on the way to the parking lot, and he can send a notification to you when you're there telling you tra traffic conditions, like Waze does, right? Hey, don't come this way, come this way because traffic's bad, or uh, parking lot A is flooded, go to parking lot B, right? He knows when you got to the parking lot because you have to show a pass on your phone to the parking lot attendant who scans it. And then in real time, it tells his system, this guy who built the system, it tells his system when you got into the parking lot. It also tells you, it tells him, his system, when you get into the front door. And he bought a 4K screen when he come in the screen, the, the door. It tells you, welcome to the stadium, Robert Scoble, on a big screen, right? And people like start uh, fighting with me. And they said, oh, I'm going to turn that shit off. I don't like to be tracked this way. I go, 
the first thing your daughter wants to see is her name up on the, sta uh, the screen. Because <laughs> everybody else is doing it, they taking selfies saying, welcome to the Super Bowl, right? We'll get about okay. privacy. Yeah, privacy is fun. Uh, <laughs> consequences are not, but privacy is. <laughs> The, the stadium, you're not going to turn off your Bluetooth because the stadium <laughs> delivers food to your seat. And the stadium has a sensor that tells you, um, I need to deacon, tells you uh, where to navigate to the bathroom with the shortest line. They have a sensor in the, in the uh, bathrooms to see the line length, right? Yeah. Women are like, yes, I want this, because the men always have a short line, and we always have a half hour line, and we want to know where the shortest line is so we can go there. Yeah, you pull out the phone, and it tells you where the shortest line is around the scene, and it navigates you that. Now think about the glasses. It's going to have a blue line on the floor telling you to go to the bathroom this way, right? Actually, it's going to be up people, but we do need to make it out. Yeah. So that's why we can leave it all. Yeah. That's the given thing. So it's not just the stadiums. Um, uh, American Airlines showed me at the at the uh, at Chicago Airport. They do the same exact thing. They know where you are in the in the airport full time. Uh, Cisco is making a router that has 32 antennas around it that knows where you are plus or minus I think uh, a meter. So as long as you have your Wi-Fi on, so it can track you around a retail store or a shopping mall kind of thing. Now. Now we get into the fun stuff. So think about going to a stadium. And uh, this is a South African company called FanCam. And they make high resolution cameras that sit on, uh, on the field. And they have a permanent camera in Madison Square Garden in New York. They have the only high resolution camera in Madison Square Garden that permanently affixed to the scoreboard. And these cameras are so high resolution that you can start down on the field. And by the way, see all the tags? People have tagged themselves on Facebook. Think about what they just did when they tagged themselves on Facebook. No, it's the same thing. But you can zoom all the way in to your picture up on the balcony from the camera on the field. In other words, he has a picture of every single human in the stadium. And he told the guy who runs his camera, who knows to tag yourself, yeah, you can go to the picture and tag yourself. He said, I know more about the customer in the sporting stadium than the sporting team knows. Because I already know the age. There's an algorithm that knows age analysis. I already know the gender. I already know uh, the sentiment. Are you having fun at certain times? I know uh, the color of the team that you're supporting. In other words, I know your team. And I know that you come to the Taylor Swift concert and the Garth Brooks concert because he can see you multiple times. And the sporting team doesn't know that, right? He doesn't know any of this stuff because all you did was buy a ticket. He actually knows you're sitting in the stadium with that ticket, right? Um, another guy you should know. Um, he knows what you were doing during the show. Yeah. Or if you're there with your girlfriend instead of your wife, right? <laughs> All sorts of fun stuff you can think about. They also know which car you're driving, so they know how much money you have, and then they can ask you. Well, uh, they already know that anyways, because you bought a VIP pass to the uh, VIP <laughs> area if you're rich, right? <laughs> this guy started Zoran, he runs $8 million venture capital fund, but his son, I think, is going to be far wealthier than this guy is. His son started a company called Tobingo. He was in the 81 pro, 8100 program. He had a very smart guy. And um, he built a company called Tobingo, which in, uh, is mostly used in colleges right now in the United States. So most people don't know about his app. But if you wake up at Santa Clara University and you want a copy, you buy, uh, buy it on the app. 70% of all transactions at Santa Clara University are already going through his app. He also knows where you are full time. He was in the surveillance program here. Come on. <laughs> he learned a few things here. He uh, knows where everybody is, right? So if you're in the Starbucks, by the way, the, the reason that so many people are using his app is because uh, if you wake up at 7 in the morning and you want a copy, 
it says your copy will be ready at 7.29 a.m. and you go and pick up the copy and you leave. You don't touch anything, you don't tap anything, you don't hand over any cash, you don't wait in line, which saves you 20 minutes every time you go to class, right, to getting a copy. But if you're in the Starbucks and you're also in my class, it'll pay you $5 to pick up my latte and bring it to class. So he's building a decentralized delivery network. He's building a Bitcoin-style currency because he doesn't want to give money to Visa because it takes 2%. And he's a surveillance guy. So if you buy the same latte every morning, he stops asking. He's, it, you don't have to type latte. It, it just says, would you like your normal like, latte? And yes. And what, what he and other people have found is if you reduce clicks, uh, to transact, you increase sales. And uh, so he's building systems to reduce clicks. He, he told me in government uh, surveillance, he's looking for people who are out of pattern because everybody has a, a pattern. Uh, everybody goes to the same church or the same school or the same work, the same grocery store, same gas station. They have a common pattern through life. And we know this when we go out of pattern, the fraud detection on our credit card stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it doesn't let us transact, right? It says, hey, call the bank and prove that you're actually uh, in Israel like it did just two days ago. Um, he says, I don't care about that. That's the government's job. I care if you're in pattern. So he's looking for when you are in pattern and doing the same thing every day, then he saves you clicks on the user interface and uh, makes more money. I think this is getting close to the end. These guys you should watch. Two of them started Siri. Um, they're starting a new company called Viv, V I V dot AI. And Siri has a problem. And it all fits into this augmented reality world because bots are going to be the god we talk to in our glasses, right? And on our phones, and on our TV, and on our device in our kitchen. Like I have an Amazon Echo. And Echo has Alexa, it's a similar system to Siri. Alexa, Cortana, Siri, Google Navigation, they all have a flaw. And the flaw is if you ask it something it doesn't know. Like if you ask Siri, how many people are checked in here on Foursquare? Siri understands you, right? At least it understands me. It might not understand your accent. <laughs> um, and Foursquare, <laughs> Foursquare has an answer. Foursquare knows how many people are checked in on, in this room right now, right? And Foursquare has an API, so they, they have a way to talk to Foursquare. But Siri has 80 lines of code that have been hard-coded. And uh, somebody at Apple hasn't yet written the code for Foursquare. So it fails and gives you a Bing answer, which is a stupid answer. And it's not nice. These guys, the uh, code is not hard-coded. It's written as you search. So that gives you several benefits. The searches can be much longer and multi-part. Um, and uh, because it's not written until you actually search, um, the, the bottom end can be much more open. And in fact, Apple already announced that they're going to make their system more open. So they're already reacting to these guys because they know they're fucked if these guys get any traction. <laughs> they will pay once they get the budget. The, pay, yeah, yeah, a lot more this time. They, they got Siri for $220 million. Um, these guys are like, I already have fucking. <laughs> you're gonna pay billions next time. Um, but Viv uh, um, is far more flexible, so Foursquare can get shoved all the data uh, from from Viv, and Viv also keeps a profile. And uh, so if you order a large pepperoni pizza from where did we get this pizza from? Whatever brownies, yeah. It, all that will be in your profile, and the next time you say, get me a pizza, and the same pizza will show up, right? Just click, right? Or talk to it, right? And so, and you can see the profile. It, it builds a profile on you, and if you don't like the pizza, you can change it, or you can uh, remove it, right? Um, so it's, and it has a much better neural network. So it, it's an exponential learner, I'd say, and Siri is a linear learner. And if they let this company have two much of a lead time, they're going to do some damage to the series and the Googles. They're all investing in the same thing now, so uh, it's fun to watch these guys. So the question is, how, how will your business be disrupted by uh, what you guys are doing here in television? I think there's a lot of disruption coming in the next five years. So, thank you. Thank you very much.
very much for work. Um, and we're on a panel or something. Oh, we'll have a few more minutes. Take a break. All right. Do you need it? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I would like to welcome to the stage Alon. Alon is from Carmel. He will present uh, the state of ARVR actually in Israel. Please, Alon. Hi, hello, my name is Alon from Gomez Ventures. Uh, Gomez is part of the Viola Group, which is the largest uh, investment group in Israel. And uh, we have been looking at this area of virtual reality and augmented reality for about a year now. And uh, we are looking to invest. Presentation um, one. What we actually did in the last year is we first we met all the big uh, companies that are innovating in this area. We met Google, Facebook, Snapchat. We met uh, big uh, Chinese giants like Tencent, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, trying to understand what's going to happen in this area. One of the reasons is that uh, this area is actually driven by the giants. So. Um, VCs cannot take the credit for this area because actually it's Google and Facebook that push, push this area forward and make most of the investments. So that's um, the first thing that uh, I want to show you is uh, the, the Israeli virtual reality and augmented reality startup landscape uh, together with Irit Khan. She needs to be here, she's here. Hello. Together with Irit, I mapped uh, uh, all the Israeli companies. This map is, by the way, uh, in SlideShare or in uh, our blog, so you can download it. Um, we tried to make a map that actually reflects the, the virtual reality and augmented reality landscape. So we didn't put great Israeli successes like uh, Mobili, which someone can say is augmented reality, or Zebra Medica or even not uh, Tapingo, which is uh, a Carmel company. Um, just because we didn't want to confuse people about uh, what it, you know, because it can be very wide and it can be very narrow. So um, I think that by looking at the Israel landscape and by looking uh, uh, at companies in the Silicon Valley in China, I definitely believe, this is my personal opinion, that Israel is the hub in the world for VR and AR after Silicon Valley in China. So it's a, it's a great place to find uh, uh, great companies. So I think that uh, Yoni from Simanage will present here and uh, uh, Alon from uh, uh, Ride On and uh, Shafa from Views and uh, Evita from uh, Fitbit. So I think. Uh, Six of the companies that are here are going to present are definitely the top, top of the companies. Jamesons as well, of course. Um, so basically, the, the categorization, categorization is a bit rough because it's both augmented reality and virtual reality. But I believe that in a year or two, uh, there will be more companies and the categorization will become more mature and we will start to understand what's actually going on here. Seeing Israel, um, Let's see, let's see what's happening in the world. So first of all, uh, this is the VC investment in the area of AR and VR. Um, it all started with uh, the Oculus acquisition in Q3 2014. And then you can see a trend of uh, uh, investments, but it, it always, you know, the statistics a bit li uh, also lies because um, this, this trend is, is, uh, is mainly uh, driven by uh, Facebook and Google. So it started by the uh, acquisition of Oculus, and then here and here you can see that it's actually uh, uh, most of the investment is in Magic Leap, and this investment was done by Alibaba and Google. So the VCs are a little bit behind. This is a market that is driven by the, by the big giants. Uh, my, my personal observation is that uh, uh, the big giants, first of all, can, can do a huge bets uh, the highly profitable companies, and they take the no-risk strategy. They can't afford to miss the next trend. So they are they, they're making huge bets, something that uh, if, if some of this is, is starting to become successful, we can see later on VCs that are going to do huge bets. But this is more or less the trend. By the way, since 2014, 
uh, 2.6 billion dollar was invested in VR and AR. Out of it, 1.4 and more than 1.4 was invested in Magic Leap. So there is a big outlier here uh, in this uh, graph. So okay, so what's happened in Israel? So together with the rate, I try to uh, we try to understand what's happening here in Israel. So we, we estimate that uh, since 2014. Uh, 2.6 already said that 2.6 billion dollar was invested uh, uh, in the U.S. in VR and AR. In Israel, we we estimated that something around 170 million dollar, uh, which represents 1.9 percent of the total investments uh, in Israel. So 1.9 is it a lot or not? I think it's proportional. In the U.S., it's 2.2, but again. Just looking at the statistics will not tell you anything because you have a lot of outliers. So if I just put Mobileye inside, it will change everything, right? Or if I take Magic Leap outside, it will take, change everything. So it's, it's uh, but yet, uh, just to, uh, to be informative, uh, we found out about 90 companies were founded since, since 2014. 40, 40 companies raised over, one point, uh, over half a million dollars and 20 companies raised over $3 million. So this is more or less the state. Now it looks, uh, it looks more, <coughs> it looks more, no, what happened? No tech. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it looks more, but uh, actually it's not small. As I said, outside uh, Silicon Valley and China, you can't see this kind of ecosystem, especially if you, Categorize it in the way that I categorize it. So it's it's definitely impressive. Now there are two types of companies in uh, VR AR. Um, one type of company is companies that leverage uh, the new markets. Um, it was here before Oculus. It was not established with the promise to revolutionize this market, but uh, it took the opportunity. So for example. If you look at uh, uh, 3D with replay technology, they, they target initially the broadcasting market and once the uh, and then leverage on the VR AR market uh, when it came and became important. The same thing you can see uh, uh, in the area of gesture control. Israel is very strong in virtual control uh, in gesture control. Initially. It was a market that targeted the, the gaming console market, etc. And now it is leveraging uh, the new hype and repositioning itself as a VR and AR companies. So this is one, one, one uh, group of companies. They have huge advantage because they, they have been here before and already have the technology. So if they are managing to leverage well um, their position, it's, it's, a, it's a huge advantage. And then there are uh, the companies that are uh, doing something new. They are established with the mission of penetrating and doing something special and unique in the area of VR and AR. And they, they, most of them, in Israel at least, were established around uh, or after Oculus uh, acquisition. Um, now, where Israel is strong, I think Israel is super strong in computer vision. There are dozens of companies in computer vision. I think that. The, the ecosystem of computer vision is, is larger than the map that we have created in VR and AR. Uh, and there is a, a huge success, Mobileye has already nine, is already worth $9 billion. There, are a lot of, there is a lot of know-how and, uh, and great companies in the area of gesture control. So Prime Sense is just an example. And there are companies that uh, have great application or know-how from uh, military application systems. Um, that this know-how is, is, is very useful in the area of AR and VR. So I think this is the main three know-how which are in, in, of Israel that can be leveraged uh, in the area of AR and VR. And then in gray, uh, Israel also has is strong in ad tech, in video, in gaming. Uh, I met those companies. Uh, uh, I met AOL, Patura, Clare. I think that they all will, will, will not uh, innovate in the short run, but will wait for initial traction. So th those types of uh, companies are more pragmatic. Once, once, once uh, we will see more traction, we'll see, in my opinion, Israeli companies in, the, in those areas to innovate. Um, 
So, uh, last slide. So, basically, uh, this is just you know, my opinion how I see uh, Israeli, the typical Israeli PCs, and, and there is some uh, generalizations here. Um, so, basically, uh, why it is interesting for, for Israeli PCs? First of all, um, the big guys are investing in it. Okay? So, and not only investing, investing strategically. So you can see valuations that have nothing to do with revenue. Those are valuations are strategic, and every, you know, all those big companies, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Sony, they are all investing and investing big in, in VR and AR. So this is a, a, a very important indication for, for uh, VCs. So I think this is the number one reason why VCs are, are very interested in this kind of in this area. And also, um, the Silicon Valley in China are influencing the Israeli VCs. Some of uh, the Chinese giants are investing in funds. So uh, all the big giants are actually invested in Israeli VCs. And uh, it seems that in China, uh, the VR AR hype is huge. So any uh, big uh, giant giant that, wants, that comes to Israel is not any, but most are interested to to see innovation also in the area of AR and VR. Um, and of course, the, there are the, 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 the VCs in, in Silicon Valley that uh, are used as uh, indication. And, 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 the and the last reason, but the more important, most important reason, actually, there are great companies and technologies in Israel. And I saw some of them. And since we almost invested in some of them, I can say that there are great companies here. So, uh, sorry for that. The microphone here, yeah. yeah. but something probably is wrong. Um, just a few challenges that we are facing. Most of the uh, VCs are facing Israeli VCs. Uh, for some reason, I'm not going to uh, get into it in details. Um, for some reason, Israeli VCs are afraid from hardware. Of threat from consumer electronics. This is um, let's not get into it. Um, okay, Israeli VCs is already learned how to do investment in B2C. At Comel, we're doing a lot of investment in B2C, but investing in B2C without traction, this is a completely different story. This is uh, very difficult for Israeli VCs. Then there is um, the open source problem. As I said, uh, Google and Facebook, they are leading the, the, the market currently. They did most of the investment in this market. And they they both uh, um, developing uh, open source platforms. So uh, Facebook is uh, developing the Facebook Surround open source, and Google with the Tango project. Um, and it's not clear what's going to happen. If the big guys are going to uh, push open source, then it might be a risk. We, we, we don't really know what will happen. And then the, the last thing is the size of the bet. For uh, a US VC to invest $10 million in a seed company is a, re is a reasonable risk. For an Israeli uh, VC, $10 million is, uh, is a big investment. It's a large round A investment. And uh, some of the companies in the area of ARVR need this money. And this is why it is challenging for uh, an Israeli VC point of view. Uh, so that's it. Uh, if anyone has a question, thank you. Thank you very much, Alon. Now we will have four mini presentation of four companies.